Et, et ce sera partagé après. Nous vous demandons, s'il vous plaît, de tenir vos micros coupés. D'écrire dans le chat euh, si vous avez des questions ou que si vous avez besoin d'aide. Euh, S'il vous plaît, euh, dites-nous lorsque vous voulez poser une question, levez la main et attendre euh, son tour serait vraiment important pour nous. Ne pas essayer également de partager son écran euh, sans demander, s'il vous plaît. Euh, nous espérons que euh, cette session se passera dans la bonne humeur avec tout le monde dans le cadre euh, du respect et encore une prévision pour dire que ce webinaire est en train d'être pour enregistrer et sera partagé euh, au public par l'UICN. Alors, sans plus tarder, je vais un peu présenter l'agenda euh, pour tout le monde. Nous allons avoir une introduction euh, de l'UICN, de l'équipe globale Air Protégée et Conservée, par euh, Madame Roxana, euh, qui est de l'équipe globale euh, Air Protégée et Conservée qui sera suivi euh, d'une présentation de la liste verte par M. Thierry, qui est euh, le gestionnaire de programme liste verte au niveau global à l'UICN. Et cela sera suivi aussi de présentations de cas d'études des pays que nous avons sélectionnés, qui sont la Tanzanie, la Guyane et la Suisse. Après, nous allons donner du temps pour les questions-réponses aux participants et aussi permettre à tout un chacun euh, dans le chat et même à travers son micro de poser des questions. Encore bienvenue. Euh, sans plus tarder, je vais juste présenter mon écran et faire euh, un petit euh, menti. OK. Um, I would like to invite everyone je vais, je vais, uh, I would like to invite everyone again, uh, just, just uh, one minute uh, to look at the uh, button, translation button, down or up, according to your screen type. We have English and French, French translation. Uh, comme dit tout à l'heure encore, nous avons la traduction anglais-français. Utilisez la langue qui est bon pour vous. OK. Alors, je ne sais pas si vous avez euh, vos téléphones ou euh, vos ordinateurs. Voici le code Manti que nous vous demandons, s'il vous plaît, de scanner et peut-être euh, de nous expliquer un peu euh, où est-ce que vous nous rejoignez. Alors, voici... Euh, je vais encore partager le menti pour voir. J'espère que tout le monde peut maintenant scanner et avoir le code. Il y a la première question qui demande d'où vous venez. Vous nous rejoignez euh, d'où? OK. Je vais aussi le mettre dans le chat. Oh, very interesting. <laughs> From Switzerland, Belgium, Guyana, Germany, Nairobi, Philippines, Democratic Republic of Congo, Brussels, London, Tanzania, US, Turkey, France. From UK, Berlin, South Africa, Nepal. Thank you. Uh, next question. Okay, we're waiting to hear from you. Learn. Perfect. 
we all would like to learn sharing experiences. Thank you. Current stakes, uh huh. Network, sure. New knowledge, yeah. Understand carbon business. <laughs> Benefit from IPs and LCs, perfect, very important. Understand, explore carbon credit financing, understand more, connect with the network. Economics, network on climate, explore carbon credit finance, new challenges, okay, protected areas, options. Wow, interesting. Yes, so without further ado, thank you so much for this. Um, I would like to pass over to Roxana. Thank you so much. You can continue to send us. Um... Thank you, um, Roxana, please, for the welcome message. Thank you. Thank you, Aisa. One second, so I can share my screen. I hope everyone can hear me and see me well. Hello, everyone, and welcome to this webinar. My name is Roxana Buchaka. I am a portfolio manager at IUCN at the Protected and Conserved Areas team. And on behalf of IUCN, I would like to, to welcome you. This is a great opportunity that uh, our team, the Protected and Conserved Area team, has uh, initiated. We will organize a series of webinars, just like Aisa said, on various topics that are extremely relevant in the context of the global policies and that we would like to translate at the level um, of the national regional policy making to the very local level. I know we have a very broad audience. I've seen already some familiar names and faces and I'm very happy to, to see you. But I know that um, we also have new colleagues, new partners in this uh, nature conservation partnership. Um, I will start by saying just a few words about IUCN, the International Union for Conservation of Nature. We are the world's largest and oldest global environmental organization. We have more than 1,400 members across 160 countries and territories. And our team that implements the IUCN program is more than 900 staff, and we're spread across 50 offices around the world. Um, you don't have to understand this very complex graphic on the screen, but it just demonstrates that we work at all levels from the local action to the global policy making. Just like Aisa was saying, we're very present in the climate negotiations as well as uh, the biodiversity negotiations, the sustainable development goals, and other decisions that are taken that impact the global policy making that uh, concern in a way or another the biodiversity conservation. We work across our secretariat, but um, our convening power is extremely important through our members, as I said, but also through our experts that now form seven commissions, not six. Uh, we recently have a commission on climate crisis in addition to all the other topics, one of them being also protected and conserved areas. Some of you might know IUCN because of the IUCN Red List of Threatened Species or maybe the nature-based solutions, but we also work on all the environmental related governance topics. And one of these very important topics is protected and conserved areas. What we do in uh, our team that is uh, based in the IUCN headquarters in Switzerland, but we have a presence across the regional offices, the national offices, and at the local level through the partners with whom we, we work, um, our mission is to drive local, fair, and effective area-based conservation to achieve global goals. So for us, it's all about how to connect the local level to the global level, how to support um, area-based conservation systems, 
and how to promote and recognize the contribution of indigenous peoples and local communities and their traditional land and knowledge to the biodiversity conservation and the associated values. And as I was saying, all the global frameworks, including the global biodiversity framework, are um, driving our conservation and mission. The way we do our work is we um, we deliver impact through initiatives such as Act 30 or the Green List. Um, Act 30 is, um, is an initiative that transforms 30 by 30 as a global target into national and local action. The Green List, my colleague Thierry will talk about, this is the global standard for protected and conserved area management and effectiveness to achieve uh, successful conservation outcomes. And there is definitely a link through our work with sustainable financing and all related topics. One of the other areas in which we engage in a very powerful way, and actually I'm happy to see one of the Biopama grantees, at least in this uh, in this webinar, is, we, is through grants. Through the Biopama and the best initiatives, we have around 400 partners across the world that receive funding through the grants we manage. And with them, together with them, we manage to deliver a very, very strong impact at the local level that then with our support and our competing power, we can promote and communicate and feed into the global decision-making. This webinar, as I was saying, is part of a, of a series. The next ones will focus on tourism and product labeling associated to protected and conserved areas. We might have other topics coming soon. And um, we are doing this because it is relevant for our work. It helps us connect with all of you to engage. And last, I want to say that um, this is a space for dialogue and sharing experiences. And we're very grateful to our colleagues from Guyana, from Tanzania, and from Switzerland to, to accept our invitation to share their experiences with us. I would also like to thank all of you for being part of this webinar and listening in and contributing actively. And also thanks to the team who, who put together this webinar. Thank you very much. Merci beaucoup, Roxana. Roxana is the gestionnaire de portfolio de l'équipe globale Air Protégé et Conservé um, au niveau du siège ici en, en Suisse. Euh, très heureux d'avoir euh, les mots de bienvenue de, au nom de l'UICN, mais aussi de l'équipe globale Air Protégée et Conservée. Euh, sans plus tarder, nous allons euh, euh, aller avec euh, mon autre collègue aussi dans l'équipe, M. Thierry Lefebvre. Euh, vous connaissez tous euh, notre produit phare, hein, la liste verte des airs protégés et conservés. Alors Thierry, c'est à toi. Merci, Aïssa. Merci beaucoup pour votre invitation. So welcome to everybody. Um, good morning, good afternoon, good evening. So my name is Thierry Lefebvre. I'm the program manager of uh, Greenlist, working with a team here in Switzerland, but also with colleagues in different regions to implement this flagship initiative of IUCN called the IUCN Greenlist of Protected and Conserved Areas. So I will we briefly mention and describe the Greenlist which is definitely linked to the financing component, uh, will be presented after with some case studies in different countries. So just to explain you what the Green List is, uh, it's a, a global standard for effective conservation. And the idea and the objectives is to recognize the well-managed and govern protected areas in, in the world, uh, regardless of the, the type of protected area, its management category, governance type, but it's also applicable to any conserved areas or effective uh, conservation measure. The idea of the, the green list is really to, to, to build an effectiveness. And by effective, we, we, we mean the ability of a protected area to meet conservation objectives, but also to deliver long-term benefits to society and ensuring that the, the site is properly managed and governed in a transparent, equitable, and participatory way. So it's a very inclusive standard, um, and the idea of the effectiveness goes beyond the management. It's really integrating the governance uh, and the conservation outcomes here. 
Bayesian green list uh, is uh, really building on, on what we call the standard. And the standard is based on a, a set of criteria. We have 17 criteria assessing the effectiveness, including uh, financing, because uh, the effectiveness of the management is also depending on the capacity, the financing capacity. And we have also more than 50 indicators that can be adapted at any context here. So we have the good governance as one of the key components of the green list standard, as well as the sound design and planning, effective management, and successful uh, conservation outcomes. So it's a comprehensive standard describing the effectiveness. And by being so comprehensive and universal, the green list is actually recognized at different levels. Uh, since 2016, uh, we have a, a clear promotion from the CBD, the Convention on Biodiversity, during the COP13, promoting the use of the Green East Standard uh, to encourage uh, protected areas management effectiveness. And since 2022, during the last COP, COP15, the Green East has been mentioned as one of the key indicators to measure and also to support the implementation of a target free on protected and conserved areas. It's not only on the coverage 30%, but this target includes also a lot of components on quality and effectiveness. And these different uh, quality elements of the target tree are clearly reflected uh, in the Green List standards. So actually the Green List is implemented in, in more than 30 countries at different levels. And we have 300 sites actually engaged in the program. Um, at different levels of uh, commitments with the support of uh, experts at national, regional, and even global level. And we are implementing different projects to support uh, sites committed to the Green Standards to achieve it. Um, for example, in the marine ecosystems in Africa, but also in South America and in Asia. So the, the global footprint of, uh, of the Greenlist program since its inception in 2020 uh, in 2012 is really important. So in less than 10 years, in fact, we are actually uh, growing and uh, expanding the green list to really sustain and support the implementation of these global commitments of the CBD uh, state parties here. So the idea is actually to, to use also the green list as a matrix that's a standard to support effectiveness, but also can be used as a matrix to really be in capacity to measure any progress towards effectiveness of the management and the governance and conservation outcomes. So this standard is actually implemented to support the development of green is bound. Uh, so financing uh, mechanisms in different countries as for example in, in Belize, but also actually we are currently developing uh, green is bound in uh, countries in Asia, particularly in Central Asia, Indonesia. So that's a power fuel uh, mechanism to really also be able to, to implement uh, and monitor progress toward uh, effectiveness for investors uh, or global donors uh, wanting to, to have a clear uh, uh, um, monitoring uh, of the impacts on the ground. Yeah. So we'll have an opportunity to, to showcase some of the benefits of the green list applied at different levels, site level, national level, and global level. At national level, it's a, it's a uh, framework uh, benchmark uh, against the target three. So it's an opportunity for the different countries or state parties to the CBD to report the implementation of these global commitments towards the 30 by 30. But at site level, it's also an opportunity to, to measure any progress and to, to improve the protection of uh, biodiversity as well as also ecosystem services and cultural values. It's a way also to, to improve the equity of the governance because the Green Standards is including in it different indicators on uh, equity uh, uh, of the governance system. And it's a global recognition that IUCN is providing to the sites uh, committed to the Green East and achieving uh, the Green East uh, standards. We are also including uh, some indicators on climate resilience and monitoring and evaluation. And last but not least, the Green East is also an opportunity to, to generate new revenues at site level, um, adding the support from different donors, uh, but also a metrics provided to, uh, to the global donors uh, to measure impacts of any investment in, in the conservation. So we have some, some key examples actually uh, in development. 
But the idea is really to link uh, really the use and the implementation of the greenly standards uh, with uh, different models to generate revenues uh, to support and improve uh, the effectiveness of uh, uh, the conservation, area-based conservation. So I will um, we will have a, an opportunity today to uh, showcase some concrete examples in different countries. Uh, in Africa, in South America, and in Europe. Some of them have been actively implementing the, the greenest standards in, in at site level, as well as also national level. I invite very uh, anybody to uh, have more information on the ICN websites at the green list that you can see on the on the on the slide, icngreenlist.org. So you can find any information uh, on the program, the standard itself, the process. So if you want to uh, have more information, please contact us directly. And if you wish also to be committed as a site to the green list, also we we will be pleased to support uh, you in this uh, in this process. Yeah. Thanks a lot for your attention. Merci beaucoup, Dr. Thierry. Ça a été vraiment très euh, explicite sur la liste verte et tout ce que la liste verte donne comme euh, appui, support euh, aux aires protégées, mais aussi conservées, y compris les AMCE, qu'on appelle autres mesures de conservation efficaces par zone. Euh, Aujourd'hui, euh, nous sommes aussi très contents de dire que la liste verte est pour les aires protégées, mais aussi les aires conservées. Alors, elle est applicable aux aires conservées. Et euh, il y a vraiment des, des tests maintenant qui sont en train de se faire dans, dans beaucoup d'endroits pour, pour essayer un peu de faire euh, l'analyse ou une évaluation de la gestion et gouvernance de ces endroits-là afin de donner des recommandations pour aller vers une excellente conservation. Alors, comme je l'ai dit avant, on a beaucoup d'accords. Il y a l'accord de Paris euh, qui parle beaucoup des émissions euh, carbone le sommet des trois bassins qui a aussi fait mention à cela quant à la souveraineté des pays dans la fixation des prix justes et comment les, les stocks carbone doivent être stockés et mettre sur le marché la vente et tout ce qui est relation internationale. Aussi, comme ma collègue Roxana l'a dit, euh, notre but ici, c'est vraiment de donner euh, un espace à tout le monde euh, d'écouter, d'apprendre les uns des autres. Je suis très heureuse d'introduire euh, Isaac Carbon Tanzania, qui est avec nous de la Tanzanie, de la vallée Yaheda, des peuples euh, de la vallée. Carbon Tanzania conçoit et met en œuvre des projets qui non seulement euh, euh, qui prennent en compte la reconnaissance des rôles des populations indigènes dans la conservation, mais aussi qui dépendent de ces endroits-là et ils sont très impliqués. Un contrat définissant euh, le partenariat et les responsabilités des parties prenantes. Carbon Tanzania développe le projet de manière à répondre aux normes internationales de certification et fait le lien avec le programme volontaire de réduction des émissions de carbone au niveau international, mais aussi avec le marché volontaire de carbone. Alors, sans plus tarder, je donne la parole à Isaac d'exposer le cas d'étude du peuple du Yahida Valley en Tanzanie. Merci. Over to you, Isaac. Thank you, Aisha. Um, I think you are getting me. Okay. Yes. Thank you. Hi, Mtana, to everyone. Uh, on behalf of my Global South Indigenous people and local communities, my name is Isaac Bryson from Yaeda Valley. This is the home of the hunter and the gatherers, the Hazabe, for more than 40,000 years ago. Though for a few decades, it has been also the host for semi-nomadic pastoralists known as Idatoge. So in general, a combination of life, hunting and gathering, as well as pastoralism, has no harm to the nature. Uh, we are just living here in Northern Tanzania and we are occupying the reference region of more than 200,000 hectares of intact forest and a few portions of grasslands. Also, we have village centers, but the huge part we occupy, it is a forested area because of our lifestyle. So I'm so grateful to, to have you all in this session. This is a great session that we are going to share the basic ideas uh, which can help us 
to have a, a, a straight way toward to deal with uh, bad climate change, to attain the global climate goals. Uh, this is a good uh, program, and I appreciate uh, uh, IUCN for this program. Without going far, I want to jump directly to the topic, especially uh, to the nature solution. As we have seen, uh, we have several we have several contests to to approach on 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 attaining the climate goals. But uh, we know that we have several solution, and the nature solution we have recognized as the great solution. And without going back, uh, we, the Yada Valley indigenous peoples, belong to hunt and gatherers, as well as uh, the pastoralists. We have been front line to secure the nature because we know that we depend direct, but very uh, sustainably for the thousands of years ago since our ancestors. So we have been having this custom of living friendly with nature. Uh, so I think when we are hunting and gathering, it's wild meat and the wild meat is from the forest. We have to conserve forest. We need tubers, edible tubers. We need uh, uh, wild fruits. We need uh, tons of honey to, to, to be sat, uh, sat, satisfac satisfactory to the uh, current generation and the future. Uh, as, a, as Also, we need this, our fellow to have a grazing pasture availability to sustain their lives. So this is our lifestyles uh, for tens of years ago, for hundreds of years ago. But uh, for sometimes, as we know, uh, we have this global population uh, increase. We have uh, realized the, in in few years ago, especially in 2000, we seen a little started invasion to our valley, a strange invasion a strange movement of people seeking for the farming opportunities that involve felling down of trees, as well as others engaging in this poaching activity, which kills the animals that are very important for the hunters. So this is an uh, uh, unsustainable ways in comparison to our ways of life. So in general to the whole valley, uh, uh, comp uh, uh, composed of 12 villages, more than 60,000 individuals. We responded by calling in the uh, individual village assembly meetings to see the basic solution uh, that can help it to respond to, to, to stop these strange invasions. So the solution that were universally decided in inclusive meetings were uh, to develop the land plan. The land plan we seen was the basic solution because we are solutions uh, uh, that is specified for hunting and gathering forest. Then we specify the areas for grazing, and the left small areas we are selected as village, which our permanent settlement, like village offices or community offices. So this plan was so good, and uh, uh, going far, our government of Tanzania uh, issued us to own this land legally. They give us the certificate of ownership. So we get that certificate of owning the hunting and gathering land as well as pastoralist land. So we seen this is the foundation, and we seen now we have the power. Then after that, it came this idea of introducing the carbon project. Because already we have this the, the right and the power of a management of our land legally and like a traditional, the past period, and like the traditional past period, but now we have additional improved legal power ownership of our land. Then we start this the project. The project is started by awareness. Carbon Tanzania is our partner, our contract, our legal partner in this project. And, uh, and we appreciate. This is our HANA, our HANA ready partner, because during the procedure, they just make awareness for us to know about this issue of uh, emission reduction uh, while measuring the credit and being paid after being sent to the market. So this generally was the procedure for sometimes. It's taken, a, it, it, it taken a, a, a long time to make people to understand. We moved through different villages and the community assembly meetings. As a result, people, they understood. And then we go directly to the agreement. In agreement, we were having this those responsibility for the community to perform, like protection, operation issues to the field, 
and all other issues to organize all issues in the field at the ground level. Then for the project developer, Carbon Tanzania was just to play a great role to support us to know those technical mechanism operation that involve are involving in project especially measuring the amount of of the of dissidents that have been absorbed eh? going and searching those voluntary market verification issues as we use always plan before they came so there is those uh, uh, technical issues they help us and we also use to engage with them because we we are member of the community somehow we have educated and we joined the carbon tanzania project with community then we are trying to link the community to understand these technical issues uh, through uh, we have been in like a link so in this sense the project was well understood and well agreed then we started then after that uh, the final destination was the revenue for, uh, to the voluntary market must come directly to us uh, we agreed through meetings 60 percent of the total revenue must come directly to us so this revenue have started flowing from and current, like 14 years ago now. So we have an experience of uh, increasing, uh, uh, annual increasing of the revenue year after year uh, since we started, because we have seen like uh, uh, this uh, idea of carbon offsetting is growing. So we appreciated on that. So the revenues that we have got, it is a monetary issue. It has helped us a lot in different issues. I can go straight to the program that have been common to the all communities around and to the all village. And we have confirmed and we are daily monitoring to see these issues is going in positive ways. Uh, so the, this monetary uh, revenue from carbon uh, project services uh, in recent uh, last year data 284 eh? 84 patients have been saved by this then it has helped us also to have food security eh? to have food security we have been uh, purchasing food for some times when there is harsh condition when there is a harsh environment eh? we have been performing issues of agreeing in meetings to purchase food and to to to, to distribute to individual house, house, household equally education we have 18 number of university students uh, currently uh, in primary school 1382 have been benefiting 222 secondary schools Hundreds of students, and they, we have this village game scout, the the community rangers who are patrolling daily to see the the security to confirm the the, the security of our forest. So we have employed this guy I called VGS, and it is one forty two guys, and we have been taking them to the training to the training government institute to uh, to to improve their knowledge. So and we are paying the monthly salary. Also, the revenue have say I have I have helped in governance issues from the community level to village issues, all the costs. Also, the revenue have helped us in developmental project, have supported the development project, this local developmental project, like building schools, building uh, uh, policy stations, and different issues that are supporting the community. More than uh, 53 buildings have been supported by this. Community microfinancing. We have seen this, the basket fund from carbon revenue. It is communal. It is coming directly to, the, to our bank account. But you, after uh, the agreement on meetings, we have established this, the cash flow from the communal level, uh, revenue to the individual, uh, to the individual benefit. So we are trying to make sure everyone is benefiting through this revenue in that sense. Uh, forest protection activities for more than one, uh, 100, 110,000 hectares have been protected uh, till today. Uh, and more than 172,000 tons of emission have been uh, absorbed. Uh, leaving out this monetary benefit, we have this non-monetary benefit from the project. 
I will go quickly because of the time, but I'm sorry. Improve the forest conditions. We have uh, the forest condition since we began. It is 14 years ago. So the condition from the time we began to till the, to this, when you compare, and when you look the trend from technical measurement, it is the forest density is increasing and the condition uh, is going well. Uh, secured, uh, secured grazing pastures for wild animals that are important, both, uh, that are important for the hunted gatherer as well as for grazing livestock for the toga. Uh, increase the wildlife. Uh, we have seen wildlife incre in increasing the wild animals, and in uh, and now at the access to hunt is getting better year after year to the Hadza. Moderate rainfall. Uh, now we are getting uh, spiritual sites well protected. Uh, we have been having this peaceful and harmony life. Uh, we have a traditional life, but now because we are affording economic. Uh, uh, economic access from this project now we have seen we like have we have both we have natural life and we have this economic access now this is like uh, we have seen it is peace harmony life it's traditional lifestyle in sense our tradition that is uh, hunting and the gathering uh, grazing has been uh, supported uh, also there is lesson learned there is lesson learned from this, our project. There is lesson learned from this, our project. Uh, the lesson learned is that we now we have recognized that we, uh, okay, thank you, that we have recognized now we have this kind of uh, right, of having right of our land. Uh, because we have certificates and the government have recognized us legal and we are performing the project with the carbon, carbon revenue, which is benefiting us. So we have seen now we have this uh, access now to the right of, uh, of our land and the benefit of our protected nature. Uh, community engagement in every stage since our, the project began. We, we were engaged in every stage to make, uh, to make sure that we are understanding this, the full mechanism without doubt. And Carbon Tanzania, I appreciate on that. Equitable benefit sharing, 60% uh, is coming directly to us, to our bank, to our communal bank accounts. Uh, and after that, we go through meetings, then we allow even individual benefit to flow in that programs as I have mentioned, health, education, and several issues. Uh, transparency issues. Uh, this project is so transparent because all issues are being conducted in public, uh, reporting in public, announcement in public, uh, agreement in public. Uh, each, each, each step will have been uh, in, in transparable way, compatible with our way of life, and also, the, it has played a great, a great support to improve our relationship. Our relationship has improved from our community ground level up to the international level because people are, are now coming to visit us and to see this uh, success. Uh, I'm generally thankful because of the time. Uh, and I appreciate this program from uh, IUCN. And, uh, I, I feel to proceed the match, but because of time, uh, let me end here and I welcome uh, question and answer uh, so that we can make this our program uh, successful. Thank you. Merci beaucoup, um, Isaac. Ça, c'était vraiment, vraiment très, très bien. On est très content d'entendre de, les cas d'études de Carbon Tanzania. You're very, very happy. Great presentation. We received good food feedback as well in the chat. Um, beaucoup de gens sont très, très contents de, de voir uh, ça à, à un niveau communautaire, mais aussi comment ils peuvent le répliquer. Alors, um, je vais juste um, dire que... Um, Ah, Isaac, you don't have the, the interpretation. We would like to uh, leave the question to the end. Uh, we have a few questions from questions from a participant about um, uh, the challenges, but uh, we'll just uh, ask everyone to still continue to ask questions in the chat and we'll take them uh, at the end of this webinar because we have two more case studies to present. So we will do the presentations and then after take the questions if that's a good thank you so much isaac that was really really good and uh, explicit thank you for sharing uh, your case study thank you asante um now um 
as you you also we had a really good presentation from carbon tanzania and um i will switch to french sorry again this was for isaac uh, because he has a uh, no um translation going on on his side thank you isaac alors maintenant carbon tanzania vend des crédits euh, à des entreprises internationales et 60% des revenus sont versés aux communautés. Ce qui montre aussi la durabilité de cette solution et qui fait que la communauté est toujours partie prenante parce que plus que 50% leur est reversé et aussi ils investissent dans des équipements durables pour la vie de la communauté euh, pour être toujours au service de la nature. Alors, sans plus tarder, nous avons un cas d'étude euh, euh, étatique euh, de la Guyane, euh, selon ART, qui est le programme euh, autonome et indépendant qui développe et euh, fait aussi les, les procédures standardisées pour créditer euh, les réductions d'émissions, le programme REDD. Euh, je, sais pas que, je pense que beaucoup de gens ici connaissent déjà. En, en Guyane, la stratégie euh, développement à faible intensité de carbone définit la vision du pays à sauver les forêts d'une taille équivalente à celle de l'Angleterre, de l'Écosse, tous ensemble réunis pour montrer un peu l'ampleur euh, de, de la géographie. Les forêts font partie euh, des boucliers de l'Amazonie et des Guyanes. Ils abritent aussi certains points chauds euh, de la biodiversité les plus importants au monde. Et ces forêts font, euh, font partie des, des, des stocks euh, 19,5 tonnes de carbone et 100% des recettes sont investies dans les priorités de développement durable à faible émission de carbone qui ont été identifiées lors de consultations nationales selon le document qui a été publié. Alors, sans plus tarder, je donnerai la parole à Pradita, qui est la représentante euh, étatique ici parmi nous, euh, qui va nous présenter le cas d'étude de la Guyane. Merci beaucoup. Thank you very much, Isa, and to the IUCN team for providing this opportunity to Guyana to present our experiences, our challenges, our lessons learned from the Guyana model. I have a few slides to share with you um, this, this morning, and hopefully at the end of the presentation, we'll also give an opportunity for um, additional information to be presented as I answer questions that um, the participants may have. So let me start by introducing um, our journey, uh, what started the process for Guyana, which has been about 13 years ago. Um, our approach in Guyana has been to engage at national level. Back in 2009, when our journey began, it was called national level engagement. Now it is uh, referred to at the international stage as jurisdictional scale engagement. Um, our model has involved in many ways a multifaceted approach, stakeholder engagement being at the center of that approach, building from a results-based payment model, which started back in 2009, and now building out, as I'll share that story, and that, that journey from about 13 years ago to now, how we've now engaged in the carbon credits market and the, uh, the process and the steps that were taken to make that journey possible. But before I get into all of that, um, allow me to share a little bit on, on Guyana as a country. Um, in Guyana, there is uh, a total land cover of 21 million hectares, 18 million hectares of forests are owned by state landowners. So the Guyana Forestry Commission and the Guyana Lands and Surveys Commission, the Protected Areas Commission, state entities, which are all state entities uh, manage about 85% of forest area in Guyana. And similar to the Tanzania experience, we have 15% of land that are titled to indigenous villages in Guyana, where indigenous peoples are called Amerindians. Guyana holds the status of high forest, low deforestation jurisdiction, and we have maintained over 99% of our forest cover over many decades of, of sustainable forest and our deforestation rate on average is below 0.05% on an average rate. The main drivers of deforestation as well as um, impacts that we see to a lesser extent from infrastructure and agriculture. 
The goals and commitments that underpin the Guyana program surround the national strategy for Guyana, which is the low carbon development strategy, as well as our global commitments that are embodied within the UNFCCC process, as well as aspects with regards to biodiversity, which we also participate in actively at the level of the Convention on Biological Diversity. On the screen here, you would see a representation of our journey. The first bit of work is from deforestation and forest degradation started as far back as 2008, 2009, when Guyana and Norway entered into a bilateral cooperation that saw payment for results coming from Norway to Guyana for maintaining low deforestation rates and therefore Guyana's status as a high forest cover and low deforestation jurisdiction. That bilateral saw close to 224 million US dollars um, coming to Guyana as revenues earned and going towards um, areas of low carbon development at the community and at the national level. That paved the way for the second phase of our journey, which I'll speak a bit more about, which has to do with engaging in carbon markets, specifically the voluntary carbon market. We had outlined as far back as 2009 when we mapped out our strategy for taking forward, creating incentives for nature, that the third phase will be engaging in the compliance market. We are seeing that there is already some move to this step, and I'll share what that embodies in a few moments as I speak about Guyana's engagement in the carbon markets. But before all of that, um, what underpins Guyana's strategic approach is Guyana's low carbon development strategy that has four pillars that we pursue. The first has to do with creating new incentives for a low carbon economy, and that embodies forest climate services, biodiversity management, and integrated water management. There is a big adaptation focus, um, a significant part of Guyana is below sea level, and because of that, there are lots of adaptation impacts in terms of floods, and these are areas where our agriculture sector is most dominant. So adaptation and climate resilience are core components of our strategy. Together with clean and renewable energy and meeting global goals, our LCDS embody the strategic vision taking Guyana's work forward. At the point in time of 2000, 2021, perhaps the end of 2020, we reached a stage where Guyana was mapping what should be the next um, milestone within our journey. At this point, we had benefited from close to 11 years of experience coming from the Guyana-Norway bilateral cooperation. And now we were making our move to map that next phase of our journey. So we assessed the various options that were out there that could offer opportunities for Guyana's engagement in the carbon market, which was identified from the very early stages as our next step following the bilateral. And we found the art trees methodology, the architecture for Red Plus transaction, the, the Red Plus environmental excellence standard, as a methodology that really sat at the core of what we also stood for in Guyana, which is maintaining Guyana's HFLD status and ensuring that the kinds of engagement we have in the carbon market will continue to protect that status. And coming off that, we commenced our engagement in December of 2020 in the Treats program as we mapped our steps to engage in the voluntary carbon market. So what are some of the key distinguishing features of our program? It is a jurisdictional scale, so it is at national level, which um, started back on the Guyana and Norway bilateral cooperation, which was also at national level. It enables Guyana to maintain our HFLD status, maintaining low deforestation rates. Um, it emphasizes the importance of not only the carbon aspect, but watershed and biodiversity aspects as well. And it saw as the very initial step of our engagement, the issuance of credits for years that were previous to our application. So um, based on how the R3 standard was structured, Guyana was able to tap into benefits and credits for the period 
five years prior to our application, which was beneficial to our engagements in that we were um, now able to have credits that not only um, took over seamlessly from the last year we were paid for services under the Ghana Norway Agreement, but there was effectively no gap year, therefore, as we engaged in, in the process. So if I can share with you what the timeline really looked like in, in a snapshot. Um, so we started work um, back in December of 2020, as I mentioned, and by August of 2021 um, through, and this is quite um, you know, a significant number of months as we went through consultations, we engaged with stakeholders, we collated technical information. We were able by August of 2021 to submit our formal documents um, under the Carbon Credits Program for assessment and verification. A huge part of that program has an independent audit feature. And we took um, the majority of the, from the period of August of 2021 to December of 2022 to see that process through um, to the point where um, there was issuance in December of 2022 for credits for the years 2016 to 2020. Fast forward to this year, we then undertook the crediting process for year 2021, and that was able to um, see through a process just like in the previous period um, for crediting that saw uh, last December, the year 2021 credits be issued. The way that our mechanism is structured in Guyana, and this is embodied in our low carbon development strategy, is that 15% of all revenues received go directly to villages, to village bank accounts. And then there is an, an additional on cap sum that is invested in national investments that also cover community level investments in schools, in infrastructure, in healthcare systems, in transportation. And this has been the model that um, is embodied not only in Guyana's low carbon development strategy, but that was also outlined in a resolution passed by the National Tushaus Council, which is the indigenous body representing indigenous leaders from all across Guyana. I mentioned this earlier, but it's a point of note that in December of 2022, it was a major moment for Guyana where we were able to be um, to benefit from the world's first issuance of forest carbon credits from the Archeries Group. And following that, a year after, in December of last year, we were able to see that process continue to the point where we had the 2021 credits be issued. Now, our benefit sharing mechanism has been one that I think stands out as um, a major feature of the Guyana program. And um, to my mind, it offers a lot of experiences and lessons learned, not only for the areas that you know have worked really well, but also to embody a lot of lessons learned for what could be done um, for other countries in a similar in a similar circumstance as high forest cover, low deforestation jurisdiction. But also there are areas that we continue to work on as we further build out this process. So as we started our journey on low carbon development, um, we developed the benefit sharing mechanism working with the National Tushaus Council, there were several um, community as well as regional level engagements. And this then went to our parliament where there was a debate on the structure. And then this was passed by a resolution that was tabled by the National Tushaus Council. So the parliamentary resolution four to six um, endorses the benefit sharing structure that we use in Guyana. Fast forward to December of 2022, after our initial batch of credits were issued to Guyana, we were fortunate to have our first sales agreement also be put into effect, which saw a third of our credits, which is about 2.5 million of Guyana's credits from every year from 2016 to 2030, sold under a commercial agreement. And with the payments for those um, credits coming in as those credits become available. That made possible for 22 and a half million US dollars be disbursed, be possible to be disbursed 
in individual village bank accounts as a cumulative total for villages to start determining what they would like to do with the money. So 22.5 million US dollars went in total to 242 villages. And Guyana's process embraced what is in the national legislation, whereby the Amerindian Act speaks to village planning. So after the funds were dispersed into the village, um, for every village, it was um, based on the population numbers. So every village benefited to uh, an amount of between 50,000 US dollars to 175,000 US dollars for just that one year. And that is intended, it is expected for that amount to continue all the way to 2030. And remember that that only represents a third of what we are able to sell in terms of carbon. So potentially that number could be much larger as we commercialize the remaining credits. So just a brief remark here in terms of how that process worked at the village level. Um, so each village um, received in the village bank account those amounts between 50 and 175,000 US dollars for that year. And the villages then set out to determine what they wanted to do with that money. And that was expressed in village sustainability plans, which were submitted to government. So those village plans, villages took somewhere between three to six months to come up with those plans. Those plans range between two to 10 years in duration. And the villages accompanied their submission of the village plans with three important pieces of supported materials. The first is a letter expressing their willingness to participate in and their approval to participate in the program. This, the second piece is the minutes of the village meeting where deliberations were had in terms of what they wanted to use the money for and the process that they undertook to then um, take that forward. And the third piece is the attendance sheet for that meeting that shows that two thirds of the attendees of the meeting agree with what was said. And that is um, at that, um, in that structure because the Amerindian Act speaks to those modalities being the benchmarks that need to be satisfied before the village plans could move forward. So an organic ground level development in terms of villages seeing what they want to take forward in the programs at village level. And that saw at the end of 2023, over 800 projects being implemented at village level that include ICT hubs, that villages are able to benefit from, um, food security projects. Um, they were also able to implement um, aspects that were oriented towards social upliftment, climate resilience, agriculture related projects. And throughout that process, villages continue to be central and solely in charge of managing the projects that are implemented. So um, in every village, it's about five projects for every annual period that we see implementation. And this is supported by NGO level um, assistance as well as government level assistance. And there are several non-carbon benefits that come from this process. We see that a lot of the projects are oriented towards protecting intact forest landscapes. A lot of the projects are oriented towards protecting threatened species as well as working with protected areas within and around those villages. On the lower left-hand corner of the screen, this is a capture of a village um, that is being supported by the National Tushals Council, working through the village plan development and determining what they would like to see as part of those of their village plan for that particular year. So a lot of positives have come from the program, but there are challenges as well. And I see these challenges potentially as providing opportunities for um, further work to be done as we move forward. In many ways, Guyana's journey has been, you know, mature to about 13 to 14 years, but in some ways we are quite young as well in terms of now engaging in the market-based mechanism, um, the voluntary, and then hopefully soon the compliance market. One of the challenges we face is that there has always been hesitation about including high forest cover low deforestation jurisdiction 
within a market-based mechanism. There are questions sometimes on, sometimes on whether these credits are truly additional, whether there is a risk that these credits would lead to um, double counting or double issuance. And we've had to demystify that using the Guyana experience in a number of cases to show that it is obviously better in our view to maintain forests than to destroy forests and then spend an enormous amount of resource requirement to rebuild those forest resources. Not only would that um, you know, ensure that the communities that depend on the forest that their livelihoods are maintained, but the entire full benefit that is surrounding those forest areas, biodiversity, watershed management, et cetera, those areas are protected by virtue of the fact that these forests are kept intact and there is a premium and a high value placed in that. We make that case often, but there is still a lot of folks out there um, who have, hold the view that HFLD jurisdictions should not be central to the market mechanism. And it's a continuous challenge that we have to face and that I think though there has been some ground gained over the last two years or so, there is a lot of work more I think needs to be done and we should, and Guyana is a part of, I think that solution. The second challenge that we face in Guyana is, it's a jurisdictional program. So it really requires for all stakeholders to come along as we move the process forward. That is never easy. And there are always criticisms, there are always um, you know, recommendations. I see criticisms as opportunity to do better. I see criticism sometimes as an opportunity and window to engage more. What we've seen in Guyana is um, growing interest from our NGO community to not only represent what they see could be the best way forward, but to also share experience and learnings. Sometimes those comments are critical to the way we've approached the process, but I think every comment helps, whether it is a criticism of how we've approached the process or whether it's a positive comment. It's an, it's an opportunity for us to continue the conversation and we see it in that light. And lastly, I'll make the point that, you know, the market space is new. So the voluntary carbon market is new. The compliance market is going to be new. The price levels um, for forest carbon credits saw a big hit at the end um, coming on following COP26 about two years ago, the price started a rapid decline. And I believe that the current price levels do not do justice to what carbon credits from HFLD jurisdictions really offer to, to the world as part of the global solution to climate to climate change. And this is an area that I hope would see, you know, a lot of boldness in terms of the private sector as well as development partners. So there are several areas I could mention more, but conscious that my time has run out, I would like to thank um, IUCN for the opportunity to share the Guyana experience, to speak a little bit about the challenges we face and the opportunities that those challenges present for us in the future as we take things forward. Thank you very much. Merci beaucoup, uh, Pradeva, pour, ce, pour ce, cette présentation, mais aussi nous donner uh, tout um, ce contexte-là dans le cadre du pays et tout. Je voudrais demander uh, aux participants qui viennent de nous rejoindre, il y a uh, la traduction qui est fournie en anglais et en français. Please, if you just, just joined us, um, look at the translation button. Uh, translation is provided in French and English and uh, choose a language which suits you best. Euh, voilà, merci beaucoup. Euh, merci beaucoup, Pradeta. Euh, nous sommes aussi euh, au courant qu'il y a beaucoup de questions sur euh, le consentement préalable euh, par rapport à la procédure de mise en place des crédits carbone euh, au niveau de la Guyane. Est-ce que euh, vous êtes au courant de cela et peut-être aussi euh, nous parler un peu de cela, de votre perspective? Aux autres participants, je dirais que euh, les questions vont venir à la fin. Euh, mettez les questions dans le chat. Je vois que le chat il est très actif. On va prendre les questions à la fin de la troisième présentation qui va se faire juste après euh, que Pradita répond à cette question. Euh, voilà. Merci beaucoup. À toi, Pradita, pour cette question. Et après, on aura euh, le cas de la Suisse. Merci beaucoup, Issa, pour cette question. 
And perhaps I can share a bit more when we come to the formal question answer session at the end. But just to give you some perspectives, some of the comments we've seen come through over the last maybe year or so have centered on the benefit sharing mechanism that I've described and also our consultations process. And I think in many ways, this is one of the experiences that many of the jurisdictions that engage in jurisdictional level applications on the carbon credits program may also face. And those have to do with how effective have been the consultations. Have they included stakeholders in a way that ensure free prior and informed consent? Is this enough? And the benefit sharing mechanism that you have in place, is it the most effective version of a benefit sharing mechanism? And I've touched a little bit on this in my presentation, but if I can just summarize in a few quick points. What we've attempted to do in Guyana is to continuously build on our strategic approach to low carbon development. So this process has started over 13 years ago, and we have engaged in consultations not as a one-off activity, but as a continuous activity over the last 13 years, including through our last low carbon development strategy, which is um, the version that takes us to 2030. So the point we emphasize when comments come through that your last phase of consultation was not enough, which is a comment that we have heard. We say to that, that we see consultations as never ending. Consultations is a part of our continuous activity in Guyana. Consultations are currently ongoing and that it's never too late for comments to come in. If there is a suggestion that you know, you can improve your program in this way, we are happy to hear those suggestions. And we take them on board. And as we continue to build in new aspects of our program, we welcome those comments. On benefits sharing, what we've tried to emphasize is, and what we've tried to highlight and amplify is the voice of the indigenous leaders at the village level. And that is the main reason when we develop the benefits sharing mechanism, we went straight to the village to ask the villagers, you develop what you want to come out of the process and not only develop it, but you manage it as well. And in a way that really is organic, is ground level and comes from what you wish to be implemented for your village. And I think that process has um, evidenced by the fact that every single Amerindian village in Guyana submitted a letter of agreement to participate in the National Carbon Credits Program. Every single village. And those letters are not just done by the village leader, but those letters are supported by two thirds majority of the villagers. So to address you know, um, comments that came and that continue to come in terms of how good is the benefit sharing mechanism? Could it be better? Could it be better? Absolutely. I think there are areas that we could do more in terms of capacity building, but the underlying point that is, um, has been our experience is we need to amplify the voices of the village leaders and of the village residents. And those are the voices we want to count in the process. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, merci beaucoup. Comme dit euh, Lucienne, euh, donne l'espace euh, pour la présentation du cas d'étude pour que euh, ces cas d'étude inspirent d'autres contextes, d'autres géographies à des reprises dans leur propre contexte. Alors, nous allons maintenant euh, aller vers euh, la Suisse. Nous sommes en Suisse euh, qui accueille euh, la Fondation Pourini. Euh, le siège est là. Avec l'UICN, ils ont lancé Nature Collectible, qui est un moyen euh, de rendre les actifs de la biodiversité commercialisables. Alors, ce sont des représentations numériques d'une espèce liée à un projet de conservation de la nature dans le monde réel. Ce n'est pas seulement euh, numérique, alors c'est ça un aspect très pratique. Et inscrit sur la blockchain pour une zéro carbone où ils ne peuvent être ni copiés ni multipliés, ce qui les rend uniques et commercialisables comme une œuvre d'art. Alors, huit aires protégées, conservées euh, sur six continents ont présenté ce travail-là pendant le premier congrès euh, de l'Afrique sur les aires protégées à Kigali. Et euh, à partir de là, il y a eu une application mobile qui a été développée, qui a collecté 16 000 euh, dollars au cours de deux semaines 
euh, les deux premiers mois et chaque utilisateur peut voir l'application. Alors, sans plus tarder, je vais euh, demander à la Fondation Porini de, de bien vouloir nous présenter euh, l'étude des cas, s'il vous plaît. Thank you so much. Merci beaucoup yes. pour la parole. Uh, the, this is indeed the Nature Collectibles is an initiative that we uh, initiated. Uh, today I will uh, talk about something else, about our carbon project. So the Nature Collectibles, I uh, recommend everyone to have a look. It's naturecollectibles.org. The thing that we do there, what is really important is we create recurring revenues. So the secondary market of these digital representations Whenever they are sold or resold, there is a, a portion of the money that goes to protected areas. So I think that's that's the transformative power of, of what we build there. So there is secondary market and it creates recurring revenues. However, what I'm uh, be talking today is our pilot project that we uh, built in Switzerland. Uh, it's a pilot project um, in a carbon credit market where uh, we have a very, you know, uh, uh, diverse market with a lot of standards with a market leader in the standard or, uh, standard organization where we have 137 different standards and i really like the initiative of, of iucn you know saying you know nature-based solutions are important and i think this is also is, uh, reflected in the markets where we see a trend for high quality nature-based solutions um so and, and to go one step beyond um the fact that we come away from data sets to data feeds is important. So when you create carbon credits, uh, monitoring, reporting, and validation is, is, is an important thing, uh, um, MRV. However, we we want to go in direction of VMRV, meaning digital monitoring, reporting, and validation using uh, a, a remote uh, a data sets to, to analyze what really happens on the ground in the forest in Switzerland. That's a tool that we tested in Switzerland. And basically, we looked at the forest reserve habitat for the Western Capricai, which is a bird species considered of least concern globally, but it's prioritized for conservation in Switzerland. And basically, what we do is uh, we looked at how is the impact of uh, um, uh, you know creating a reserve habitat on uh, carbon capture and i think to make the results you know very short is and oversimplified is basically if you create measurements for biodiversity you will have an increase of carbon sequestration and i think this is this is very very powerful learning that that you know by creating areas for biodiversity you additionally create a higher carbon sequestration. So, um, and, and the way we did it is using uh, data from remote sensing and growth simulation models, and, you know, looking at biomass volume from 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 uh, from the ground. Um, and what, what is really important is, is to see that we have a data stream. So this is also important for the market afterwards, so that you can say, well, you know, there is always risk involved with carbon credits. What happens if the, the forest burns down, things like that. So usually in, in, in the markets, you have, you know, um, uh, sellers who sell baskets of credits where, where they mix different credits. But if you have a DMRE, digital monitoring, reporting and validation method, you can say, well, actually we have a data feed that monitors on a regular basis the the, the impact that we create through uh, uh, the activities we do in, in uh, for biodiversity. And so a this this is uh, an important finding. We have uh, quite a long study about it. Uh, I'm happy to to share it with you. Um, and and the learning really is if you create biodiversity uh, uh, measures, you can improve the sequestration of carbon. Uh, we also looked at additionality that can be uh, uh, guaranteed. And the last and uh, the uh, uh, also important point is that um, the, we we can compare baselines. So we know what was before the activity and we see what 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 is after the activity. So 
already 60% of, of the standards of Greenlist standard, you know, help to create an impact. That's the, that's a very strong finding. So uh, the idea is to go one step beyond and say, okay, we have the Greenlist standard. And if we know it's implemented based on the findings of this study, we know it has an impact of, of on, on the carbon credit uh, 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 generation. Clearly here it's about forest. It's it's very specific to Switzerland. Uh, you need to 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 use models that exist in Switzerland for for forest growth. But I invite everybody to to read the uh, uh, the detailed study and uh, and have a look at at uh, the caper kai um, that is being protected in Switzerland and and by the measurements you know um, generates uh, carbon sequestration. I know this is a short uh, presentation, but I was expecting to be a bit earlier and I have to leave, unfortunately, in six minutes uh, quickly away for five for five minutes. So I'm happy to answer the questions now and then again in 10 minutes. Uh, so uh, I'm more too happy the, to, to answer uh, some questions now and then a bit later in, in the uh, panel. Merci beaucoup, um, Tony. Ça, c'était vraiment uh, très brief, mais aussi uh, direct uh, sur ce que vous voulez transférer comme message. Alors, j'inviterai uh, tout le monde à aller sur la plateforme Panorama pour avoir plus d'informations sur uh, la solution Nature Connectible. Uh, aussi, uh, peut-être aussi être en contact avec vous. Vous pouvez mettre votre email dans le chat. Pour que si vous quittez, si les, les participants ils ont des questions, ils vont directement euh, prendre attache avec vous. Alors, ça, ce serait un, un premier pas. Alors, merci à tous euh, pour les présentations. C'était vraiment très euh, détaillé. Maintenant, c'est la phase questions-réponses. On a reçu des questions dans le chat. On va peut-être commencer dans les, dans, dans, à répondre à ces questions-là. Après, nous allons venir aux questions live, euh, si le temps le permet, bien sûr. Euh, il y a Carbon Tanzania déjà avec Isaac et Winnie. Alors, si vous êtes en ligne, nous avons reçu pas mal de questions sur les aspects difficiles pour l'engagement de la communauté par rapport à la finance carbone. Comment vous avez impliqué la communauté et s'il y a eu des, des moments où c'était vraiment dur pour vous pour avancer, des moments où vous avez pensé que ça n'allait pas réussir à avoir ce projet carbone au niveau euh, de la communauté en Tanzanie. Alors, je pense que euh, Isaac est parmi nous, j'espère, ou Winnie ou Sarah pour répondre à ces questions. Alors, ah, je vois Carbone Tanzania. Hello, I'm here. Thank you. My Winnie. name is Winnie, and I'm the homes manager here at, the, at our headquarters office in Arusha, Tanzania. I think you've seen questions, and maybe I will just read them for you again. Yes. Uh, we've received for um, Carbon Tanzania. Uh, uh, you have the chat function, uh, the, the interpretation fun button um, down if you would like to turn in, uh, but I can also do in English. What have been the most difficult aspect of engaging carbon finance at the community level? Have there been any downsides to your carbon project? That's the first question. The second is how is your collaboration with the Tanzanian Wildlife Authority and the government? Uh, second, third is how long has the project been going on. Uh, from what year did you get full community engagement and benefit? How long did it took for the community to be fully cooperative? Fourth question, are you being taxed by TRA and which licenses do you have to pay the government for the funds? Uh, but also the last one fifth is what were the main stages and lessons learned during the process of establishing carbon credit? So I just um, sum up all the questions now. You can maybe maybe some they they mean the same thing. You can try to respond to them as well. I put yeah. Okay, thank you. Um, I've seen the questions and I've tried to yes answer some of them within because I'm I'm sourcing especially the finance 
related questions from the finance manager because of the numbers and whatnot, but I may read again the answers that I put into the questions. So for example, like the question about how is your collaboration with the Tanzania Wildlife Authority and the government? So here we only have two projects which are operating under the WMA, the Wildlife Management Authority. So we still collaborate with them to ensure that we are um, in hand with their policies and protecting the forests and also allowing them to also practice their nomadic life, lifestyle of um, livestock keeping. So yes, we work in hand with the WMA in the Makame, WMA project and Ruvuma project. And then um, there's another question about, I think that the questions have disappeared. <laughs> so how long has the project been going on? From what year did you get full community engagement and see benefits? So with the uh, projects, with we have four projects, but we began with our first project was in Yaeda, the one that Isaac just um, presented about. So this was the first project to be developed and started operating back in 2015. But I think uh, two years time, that's when they started receiving the revenue and also seeing the benefits into the communities. Um, I'm not sure if Isaac is here. Is Isaac still in here because he's in the project area? So I won't be very technical with the community side because I'm just in the office. I can see him. Isaac is here. Oh, Isaac is here. So there's this other question about tax. So are you being taxed by TRA and or which mm. licenses do you have to pay to the government? for the funds received from Carbon Tanzania. So initially, these were based on the contracts with each project developed in each area. So according to the agreement with the area, but then last year there have been changes with the regulations in the, with the Republic of Tanzania, the United Republic of Tanzania. So there's a um, finance bill introduced whereby 10% withholding tax um, on payment related carbon emission reduction. So they deduct 10% of the withholding tax. And there's another question following up saying, so who pays the 10% withholding tax, the communities? So here it's both any per person making payments in respect of verified emission reduction, the VER within United Republic of Tanzania. So both, if it's us, if it's Carbon Tanzania, then it has to be deducted the 10%. And if payments are coming from the community, similar, they deduct the 10%. Um, I don't know if I'm missing any other question. I think I've seen other questions, but I can't see them anymore. <laughs> I think you, you, you've answered most of the questions. Maybe we get some live questions as well. Um, you, you, I don't know if participant, we are in the um, Zoom meeting type. Uh, you all able to speak, raise your hand. I would be happy to take questions from the audience as well. Uh, you can raise your hand, unmute maybe and come in. I cannot see because we have uh, <laughs> so many participants online. You can maybe speak directly if you don't mind. Yes, Valex. We can't hear you. Maybe you can speak directly. Who is, is Ushaka? Okay, please unmute yourself if you have a question, ask directly. Okay, so now we have a, also a question for you. Um, uh, with, we continue to take question in the chat, maybe. Uh, from Kevin.
Uh, I don't know if he, Kevin is with us, but I would just read the question. Um, yeah? Okay. okay. Yeah. Sorry, I, I didn't know if you were going to read the question or, or you wanted you, to. You can ask directly. Thank you. So to, to any of the presenters, all of them, um, I'd just like to know to what extent the income that has been generated from these carbon agreements has been able to cover or to what extent has it contrib contributed to the costs required to effectively manage the protected and conserved areas um, with, within these uh, carbon credit areas? Thank you. I think we start with Predita, uh, Predipa first this time. Thanks a lot for that question, um, Kevon. Um, from the Guyana side, the structure of the program is that the benefits that flow to villages um, are are they do not include any cost that the villages have to that have to be incurred for protected areas management. So there are costs that um, are carried to make the program possible. So like in the Guyana case, there is the program cost to engage in our treats. There is about, um, on an annual basis for credits to be issued to Guyana, it costs about a million US dollars on average for the, the fee for those credits to be issued. There are costs that are associated with audits and verification. And there are costs that are associated with running an MRV system that ensure that protected areas are managed, intact forest landscapes are maintained, biodiversity hotspots are protected, watersheds are protected. All of those costs are carried by the state. So um, in the case of Guyana, last year, for example, where Guyana earned $150 million from the sale of the carbon credits that we've managed to achieve so far, the funds that go to villages do not deduct for any of that because those costs are carried solely by the state. So audit costs, verification costs, costs that are associated with protected areas and biodiversity management, those are all covered separately by the state. So the monies that reach to the village bank accounts are solely for the use by villages for income generating projects, social upliftment projects, and food security projects, and anything that the village identify that they would like to do for village development. Thank you so much. I think we now move on to um, Purini or um, uh, Carbon Tanzania, same question. Uh, just to acknowledge that uh, Gedita, uh, your um, context is countrywide and, and carbon Tanzania is community uh, at the community level. Uh, that just does make this small difference. Um, maybe I let you Isaac or um, Winnie reply to that. Sorry, could you repeat the question? Kevin, over to you again. <laughs> No, sure. Thank you very much. Um, what I'm keen to hear is the extent to which the income that is generated from your um, carbon credit agreements has been able to cover or to what extent does it contribute to the costs that are required to effectively manage the related protected and conserved areas. In other words, to provide the assurance that the protected and conserved areas can still deliver the services related to, to carbon sequestration. Thank you. Okay, thank you. So to answer your question, uh, what with the mechanism of the percentage that goes back to the community where everything is on ground taking place, um, the mechanism is the community people then, uh, uh, everything is in their hands to decide on what to do. So they decide on the allocation of the funds so meaning they put together the cost, they put together the development pro, um, activities and whatnot, so they know. So I'll leave it to Isaac, so since he's in ground, to answer in particular how they make sure that the costs really fit in into the revenue that they receive, if they face any challenge or insufficiency in funds. Karibu, Isaac. You are muted. 
You are muted, Isaac. We can't hear you. Thank you. I have seen I'm um, out of charge. Maybe the great answer from uh, Winnie is great, but also I can add that we have those like a village game scout who we have employed and we are paying monthly, monthly salary from this revenue to make sure that the agreement that we have made in meetings is well uh, followed in, in forest for the surface of the nature. Ah, shit. Thank you. This is a battery. This is field work. Um, we totally understand it happens. And uh, um, it's unfortunate, but it was, was good to have you uh, for the last um, two hours, um, I would say. So we have a question from Franz Mazunki, the Jew Reserve. Franz, but Winnie is with us and she will uh, cover perfectly for current Tanzania. Franz, can you please ask your question, please? Hello everyone, I'm Franz from Masungi here in the Philippines. So um, I'm very interested in how to start creating revenue for carbon credits since um, here in the Philippines, no project has been observed yet. So I'm really keen to learning. The organization is keen to learning on how we can start this. So we are an NGO here in the Philippines conserving and protecting a specific limestone karst landscape that is inside a watershed. And we're also working with the indigenous community here. So yeah, I hope our question gets answered. Thank you. Thank you so much. So like quickly, how do we start? If someone would like to replicate your solution, what what are the, the first steps? So the first steps that um, I'm aware of is first we look at the already existing natural forests. So we our approach is to make sure that we conserve the existing natural forests and also having to learn how the, the culture of the indigenous people who live within that area, how they live, making sure that we understand their laws and traditions and if they're livestock keepers or if they're agriculturalists and things like that to make sure whatever mechanism that we're going to be implemented also preserve their culture and tradition. And also um, having to deal with the natural forest, then it's less work because the healthier the forest, then of course, the better the quality of the credits of the uh, carbon absorbed. So yes, I would say that Firstly, having to understand the area that you want to develop your carbon project and also having to ensure that you um, work easily with the forest that's already existing. Because if that area has a forest, then it's easy to in engage with the community because they also depend on the forest in their daily activities. So it's more of a give and take mechanism. So it, it becomes easier. Hmm. Pradita would like to add something. Someone would like to replicate your solution. I think from the Guyana experience, um, because it's a jurisdictional scale, I think it offers a lot of exposure and lessons learned in terms of, um, you know, what has worked for us, the areas that, you know, we see further opportunities for expansion of the program. There are a lot of, I think, interest now more than about two years ago in on jurisdictional scale programs. And I think that signals to us that even um, jurisdictions that were operating at a project level are interested now in scaling up those efforts. Um, that kind of approach would never come without challenges. And I think being bold enough to address those challenges as we move forward. I don't think um, there would ever be a program where there isn't a challenge. There would always be challenges. But I think the way that would work best, at least from our experience, we have to look at the opportunities that the challenges present. And I think case in point in Guyana would be the comments, as I mentioned in my earlier feedback, that come as a result of consultations, benefits sharing, um, assurance of price level on carbon credit sale, you know, those kinds of fundamental issues that are sometimes not within the control of the program itself. 
Um, I think scaling up project level uh, activities to jurisdictional scale would be important as we move forward because not only is, you know, it, is it important to see more projects being implemented, but I think the scaling up of these would be essential. And lastly, I think, you know, one of the lessons we've learned in Guyana is that sometimes not all of the answers are available when you need it, but you just have to press forward and to find innovative solutions to answering sometimes complex questions. Because although I didn't delve too much into this, the market-based structure under the Paris Agreement, Article 6, is still evolving. You know, what will be the compliance market has a few years more to go. And yet we are, you know, moving ahead in this ambitious way to head towards the compliance market when we don't quite know what the shape of that market will be. So the message from, our, from us and the learning that we have had in terms of the market space is that not all the answers will be available when you pursue the program, but sometimes trying to find the best approach that currently fits what is out there, and then you continue leaving space for improvements to be made. And that covers all aspects, consultations, as well as market-facing areas. Thank you. Tony, would like to add something to those two questions from uh, Kevin and... <laughs> Yeah, so in our studies, basically, we we looked at the delta that we have from, you know, how would you, how much we will be able to generate for these carbon credits in Switzerland and the costs to maintain uh, um, uh, the activities. So, so we still have a negative delta. So, so we would need to have a um, a higher priced uh, a carbon credit market. Um, that's that's one learning, but I think you know costs are very high in Switzerland, so it might be very well different in other uh, places of the countries to uh, of the world to to um, not to have a ne negative outcome. The and the other thing is when how can you adopt learnings, and and I'm I'm taking a very high high level approach here. I mean, in the voluntary carbon market, um, if you have, you know, we don't necessarily need to go with the methodologies and standards that exist. I, I quite honestly think IUCN has the possibility and the power and the credibility to to uh, uh, to establish a standard um, like GLS plus that that has a high credibility where where ideally the vision could be that you say well you know with the pilot we could show if you have biodiversity activities you have a higher mm -hmm. a carbon capture why not use the green list standard that ensures this biodiversity impact as uh, underlying for the carbon credits release so, so that that would be a very interesting approach of course the other part of it is we need credibility in the market. So ideally a partnership with a, a large player, a global brand who says, well, actually, you know, we think this methodology is something we want to support and and uh, we, we see makes sense because it combines carbon credits and biodiversity. I think then, then that would be the easiest approach for projects in the field because... Um, then we don't need to go and discuss about methodologies. If if we have a, a, a buyer and IUCN with the credibility and the Greenly Start standard, who's already there, uh, and the learning from the pilot is okay. If they understand it, then we know concrete are generated. That will be the the best world solution. Uh, on the other hand, I mean, there's so many ways to 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 actually, you know, create, create concrete. So many different standards, so many organizations. Um, there, there is, of course, the established organizations, but also other organizations that start to pop up like CELO, who have a very low threshold to create methodologies that make sense in your setting that might be very specific and very localized. So, so I think the the field is very fast and the opportunity mm -hmm. is big in particular because because IUCN with the Greenlist standard really has a potential to make uh, an impact. Thank you so much. Uh, we've enjoyed uh, also Green's uh, presentation by our IUCN colleague, uh, the standard, and also please uh, reach out to us if you need info on the Greenlist and would like to commit to the Greenlist 
uh, process in your country. We have uh, someone um, um, hand with Amir Indian People Association, and we had some or someone from DRC. Uh, maybe we take first the Amir Indian People Association, and then we go back to the DRC colleagues. Thank you. Um, my name is Nicholas Peters uh, from the Armenian People's Association. Uh, thank you again, Pradeep, for your presentation. Um, just a question following up on your last point. Um, in Guyana's case, given that the country is going to be participating more in carbon markets, will there be other opportunities to renegotiate how benefit uh, sharing models are, are done, are implemented? And if so, is there a consideration for how this would be done? Um, whether it's more community focused or would happen on a national consultation scale. Um, have there been um, planning for this as the country continues to participate in these markets? Thank you so much. This would be for Pradeta. Can we hear from the DRC colleague or uh, Pradeta would like to reply to this question quickly? Sure. So I can give a quick response. Um, thanks to my APA colleagues for being in the program and also for, for that question. You know, I think um, a lot of the Guyana experience over the last maybe two and a half to three years is a building block to my mind of what is to come. And what we've outlined, not only as the, um, the fundamentals of the program, the process of implementing actions, the benefit sharing mechanism, I think there is certainly room, a lot of room for comments to come in, for good recommendations to come in in terms of how the program could more effectively serve if you see there is significant room for improvement, how this could be done, how you see this working at the village level. So most definitely, I think there is room. We are planning to have a midterm evaluation of the program, and we certainly would benefit from recommendations in terms of how we could more effectively involve community level feedback. The benefit sharing mechanism is new, even though We've started this under the Guyana Norway Agreement. It's for the first time that funds are going to Indigenous villages directly for them to make decisions what they would like to do with the resources. So the learning experience, I think, could definitely be built out and value um, and bring value from organizations that work with Indigenous peoples like the APA, like other, um, other private sector and civil society organizations as well. So the, the simple answer is yes, and we look forward to constructive engagement with the APA as we move forward and other stakeholders. Thank you. Merci beaucoup, Pradeta. Um, just a petit rappel que nous avons que moins de 10 minutes. Nous avons 9 minutes uh, pour cet appel. Alors, la question de Oscar Mbongo Ntezolo. Oscar, la parole est à vous. Ok, euh, si Oscar n'est pas prêt, euh, nous, a, nous pouvons prendre une autre question. Si une personne veut poser sa question, on peut juste faire le unmute et parler directement. Il y a aussi des questions dans le chat. Ok, alors la question, on va aller alors avec les questions dans le chat. Um, la question, c'est comment l'UICN peut aider uh, les, les organisations à, à accéder um, à ces marchés uh, de carbone, um, comme la Tanzanie et autres. Comment l'UICN peut accompagner les communautés autochtones uh, à développer et, et parce qu'ils ont des forêts communautaires, il y a des stocks de carbone, mais ils ne sont pas certainement au courant des mécanismes. Alors, uh, comme... Um, euh, Tony l'a dit, euh, l'UICN n'a pas actuellement de, de mécanisme pour dire ça, c'est un dispositif où on peut aider les pays ou euh, avoir accès à ça. C'est fait au niveau des RDD+. Beaucoup de, de pays ont déjà accès à ça et il y a des comités au niveau national qui sont au courant de cela. Alors, ce qu'on peut dire, c'est que nous avons les standards de la liste verte qui est pris comme mesure de vérification euh, et d'assurance euh, de ces aires protégées-là, de tout ce qui est l'évaluation de l'air gestion et gouvernance qui est mis en œuvre au niveau national à travers les aires protégées et conservées. Ça, c'est juste cette partie euh, vérification que l'UICN peut donner aux aires protégées, mais l'accès au crédit carbone, 
euh, n'est pas encore euh, très bien développé, mais c'est quelque chose qu'on peut toujours discuter. On a beaucoup d'équipes, euh, on a euh, des équipes au niveau du siège, on a l'équipe euh, Océan qui, qui parle, qui fait beaucoup de travail sur le carbone bleu. Le blue, blue Bond et, et le Blue Carbon, on peut toujours mettre en contact. Alors, c'est de, de nous écrire à l'email aucngrillis.org euh, pour qu'on puisse vous répondre et vous connecter directement avec la meilleure personne pour cela. N'hésitez pas à nous écrire. Il y a eu encore une question euh, euh, sur euh, l'implication des communautés. Euh, alors, ça, c'est aussi quelque chose que euh, l'UICN a a beaucoup de standards, on a beaucoup de publications, on a une librairie en ligne sur beaucoup de questions euh, qui ont été traitées dans la mise en œuvre de nos projets. J'inviterai aussi tout un chacun à consulter notre librairie en ligne, la librairie de l'UICN. Je vais aussi mettre le lien là pour avoir accès à toutes ces publications, à toutes ces bases de données et vous dire aussi que euh, vous pouvez nous, nous, nous écrire à l'adresse email que je viens de dire pour euh, poser des questions. Vous voulez être connecté avec l'un des, des et, euh, des, des personnes qui ont discuté ici, n'hésitez pas. Alors, je vais faire un dernier tour de table euh, pour les euh, présentateurs pour donner un mot de la fin parce qu'on s'approche vraiment de la fin et c'était très, très intéressant. Nous avons eu beaucoup de, plus que 500 personnes inscrites pour ce webinaire qui était un record pour nous auquel on ne s'est vraiment pas attendu. Euh, C'est vraiment remercier, mais aussi vous donner la parole pour les derniers mots. Alors, je commence par... Euh, par Praleta, tu es déjà euh, sur mon écran. Après, ce sera Winnie et euh, Tony. Merci beaucoup pour le mot de, de fin, s'il vous plaît. Bonjour, okay. Aizen. Thank you very much, Aizen. So I would like to thank the IUCN team for this opportunity. Um, the Guyana program has been an interesting one for us as we develop it, you know, from the jurisdictional scale. It has um, led to a lot of lessons that I think we could share in terms of what works, what could be improved and the opportunities for future work. And we look forward to continued collaboration with the IUCN and stakeholders and partners on this call, local and international stakeholders, as we continue our work on climate and, and carbon markets and carbon credits in general. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. Tony? Thank you for the words. So uh, with the biodiversity loss and the, the big uh, challenges we have with raising CO2 levels, some people even say it's the pyrocene with the heat that we generate, I think it is super interesting to be at a place and to see where we can have a solution that combines something that that you know makes a synergy between solving biodiversity loss and uh, uh, carbon sequestration so so i think it, it is the perfect place to be uh, to show that protected area really do have an impact of course the market side of it, it's still open, but I'm very confident that there will be solutions for that, particularly if we see that tokenized solution with blockchain markets that are more liquid and 24-7 uh, and instant and transparent and the deficiency, we, we will be able to create transparency and efficiency also in the market and then have this, this sweet spot of a market that, that wants these credits that protected areas can generate. So I'm still optimistic. Thank you so much. Uh, Winnie, uh, last words. Um, on behalf of Isaac, who had prepared himself for the presentation, but unfortunately the network hasn't, I mean, the battery went off. But I would like to thank you for firstly giving us the, this opportunity to being here and presenting what we do, our mechanisms and the role of the indigenous people the, and the local communities we work with very closely. And it's been great to learn from all the other participants. So yeah, we look forward to keep learning more. As I said, it's, an, um, it's a market that keeps evolving every day. So adapting to the changes, having to learn from different partners and stakeholders from different aspects and then in the policies, procedures, we are very grateful for this opportunity. Thank you. Merci beaucoup. On est aussi très content d'avoir ces participants qui sont restés avec nous, qui ont pris de leur temps pour nous écouter, pour être là. 
pour poser des questions, pour comprendre ces solutions, pour euh, les répliquer dans leur contexte. C'est pour vous dire que ça, c'est la première euh, fois qu'on fait euh, ce grand webinaire à l'échelle internationale pour cette communauté globale euh, conservation euh, de la nature. Vous dire aussi qu'en juin, il y aura le deuxième webinaire qu'on va faire sur... Euh, les, les, les techniques pour le tourisme dans les aires protégées et conservées, comment générer de l'argent euh, à travers le tourisme durable dans les aires protégées et conservées. Et après, ce sera le, le, le labeling, comment euh, donner des labels aux produits des aires protégées et conservées, des labels durables pour pouvoir encore générer des revenus par rapport à cela. Alors, c'est une première. Euh, ça va continuer. On vous prie de, de rester avec nous, de nous suivre sur nos chaînes. Je voudrais remercier ici mon collègue Charlie, qui a beaucoup travaillé à, à, à la réalisation de ce webinaire principalement, mais aussi de, de tout ce qui est logistique, de tout ce qui est communication, de, de tout ce qui est mise en œuvre de euh, ce présent webinaire et des autres à venir. Nos collègues de la communication, Daniel, Derrick, euh, nos collègues de la liste verte, Roxana, qui a présenté le portfolio de l'équipe globale. Euh, à toute l'équipe Air Protégée et Conservée au niveau global ici euh, au siège de l'UICN et à tout le monde, Guyane, Philippines, l'Allemagne, que vous nous suivez, de DRC, euh, l'Afrique du Sud, partout dans le monde. Bonjour ou bonsoir, quel que soit le temps qu'il fait chez vous. Je vous souhaite euh, une excellente soirée parce que nous, c'est vraiment un peu le soir ici. Euh, et voilà, on se dit à juin euh, pour celui sur euh, le tourisme durable et la génération de revenus. Merci beaucoup euh, d'être resté avec nous. On va partager euh, l'enregistrement avec tout le monde. Euh, vous aurez accès et on se dit à plus tard euh, pour les autres webinaires. Merci beaucoup. Merci, merci, merci. Au revoir. Au revoir à tous.